Welcome to this week's Multifamily Law School. Almost like a course in commercial real estate law. Um, because we'll be dealing with all different aspects of the law uh, as it relates to real estate um, and uh, trying to bring a little life to it just so that you can all understand how this game works. Um, and when you're in it, you know what you need to know and what you need to do. Um, we are going to Iraq our cases. So um, when we look at a case, uh, I'll try to get it out to you beforehand. I'll try to get it out in, in uh, uh, either blast email or what have you. But I gave you the link to this week's. It's a it's called JKS Realty versus the city of Nashville, where I'm sitting right now. And this is like a walk down memory lane for me because there's a lot of personal stuff in this particular uh, case that uh, you know I look back on. And I think, wow, I knew these people. I knew, knew these places, and I knew what was going on at the time, even though it was a long time, lifetime. Oh, you vey. Uh, but listen, what you might want to do is just uh, to read along is download the, the case and, and we're going to get started. And uh, I think it's important um, that I explain to you the the the, the law that we're dealing with, um, the fact that this is New Hampshire law. OK, but what's really interesting about this case is New Hampshire, uh, because it went up to the Supreme Court, um, it it they had to look outside of New Hampshire for case law because there was nothing on point in New Hampshire to look to. So, so New Hampshire cases in New Hampshire Supreme Court are, are um, uh, primary source cases. And if you can't find anything on point, you've got to look at other states. And the, the way you look at the other states is the fact that you look to, you have to understand the history of the, of the origins of the constitution in New Hampshire. Or you have to look at the history of the origins of the Constitution in whatever state you're looking at. So, for example, Massachusetts, Maine, Maine was originally a part of Massachusetts, and they separated. And Maine essentially inherited Massachusetts's Constitution. So if you go look at the, at the Maine Constitution, it looks a lot like the Massachusetts Constitution. So whenever Maine is trying to decide a case at their Supreme Court level, and they can't find anything on point, the first place they go to look is Massachusetts. And then it starts looking around other other cases in the area uh, to, to uh, find something that'll answer their question. Even when you go back out and you look at all the Western uh, states, you have to understand when that state uh, was, was formed and what other states were formed around the same time and did they use the same type of constitution? So as you progress across these 50 states or 58 states, uh, as you uh, cross across the, go across the, the fruited plains uh, and you stop in different states, those states will use the case law from other states who have a similar constitution. That's why you see a lot of these um, federal districts are situated re uh, um, geographically because that's kind of like where they all got their jurisprudence from. Uh, so it's really interesting. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we, as we move on. But in this particular case, uh, it was uh, JKS Realty uh, versus the city of Nashua. And what's really kind of interesting is uh, Jamie McNamee, McNamee, oh, I can't, I can never, I can never pronounce his name, but he was called Jamie. Uh, he, he recently passed away. He was, he was, uh, I'd say about five or 10 years old than I am. He had a brain tumor. Um, he was he was the solicitor. Uh, he was a, the general counsel for the city of Nashville at the time. And then uh, he had Stephen Bennett uh, actually pled the case up at the Supreme Court level. Uh, Jamie, uh, Stephen, Be Stephen Bennett is actually the corporation counsel today for the city of Nashua. Um, and then for JKS Realty, the, uh, the lawyers for JKS uh, was uh, Jerry Prunier of uh, Nashua. He was the go-to guy in the city of Nashua for all the zoning, all the developers used Jerry Prunier. Um, and he had a nice little practice. He just passed away at the age of 90 um, just recently. His son, Rob Prunier, great guy. He's on the board of directors at the Nashua YMCA along with me. Um, and uh, he went to high school. He, he was a year or two behind me in high school. But these are the names. So I go back and I look at this case and I see all that was going on. Now, to add a little bit more color to this, this happens to be an eminent, eminent domain case. But uh, what we're calling now as a um, essentially a where am I looking? It's an inverse. Uh, 
domain. Let me see. What do we hold on? Let me find the words I'm looking for. An inverse condemnation. Inverse condemnation. Now, let me just explain the word condemnation. I mean, you might think, oh, your house got condemned because your mother was a lousy housekeeper. No. Condemnation is the term that's used for any type of a government taking. Eminent domain is a condemnation. Uh, so, and essentially, that's what this is. It's an eminent domain case, but they're calling it an inverse condemnation. And this is kind of novel. But let me go back and say, historically, the house that I grew up in, in the city of Nashua, was taken by condemnation by the state, taken, it through, taken by eminent domain. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that more as we go through this particular case. But in this case, let's talk about the facts. Now, um, the the question, and I'm, I didn't actually, I did not Iraq this case uh, before I did it, um, is... Uh, Whenever you get a, a law school class uh, case, you look at you, I rack it, you uh, issue rules, analysis, analysis and conclusion. So the first question we're going to ask ourselves is what's the issue here? Why did this case get to the New Hampshire Supreme Court? The only cases that go to the New Hampshire Supreme Court are what we call cases of first impression, meaning uh, this particular type of question has never been decided before in any of the lower courts. And therefore, this has to make it all the way up to the Supreme Court to get an answer. It is a case of first impression, as this one was. So as we go through it, I'll, I'll try to pull, pull out where the, the justice uh, decided what the actual issue is in this case. And uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll take it from there. But let's get into the facts of this case to begin with. All right. All right. Uh, it, the petitioners were two trusts. Petitioners in this particular case were the plaintiffs. Uh, they uh, they owned property, tenants in common, 26.8 acres, parcel of, of land. They were developers, all right? Per, property was purchased in 1980 for purposes of development or sale to a developer. It is bisected by Baldwin Street. Folks, I could take a nine iron and hit Baldwin Street right behind me, oh, right here. Uh, which provides the most feasible access to the property. The northern section of the property abuts railroad tracks. Property is located in the area of the planned Broad Street Parkway, right down there. It's a road they built to keep you out of downtown Nashua because downtown Nashua is getting too congested. So back in the 80s, when this was getting started, they were having problems with it. With it. We were having problems with the traffic. Now, the Broad Street Parkway was conceived in the city in the 1970s. This is important. I want you to understand this. To address air quality on Main Street. Yeah, they were just trying to make it less congested, but they blame it on the air quality. That's the way you get federal money, as well as congestion in downtown Nashua, and also to provide a second river crossing over the Nashua River. In 1985, the Broad Street Parkway was included in the city's master plan. 1985. So they started talking about it in 1970. It appeared in the master plan for the city in 1985. Now, folks, if you are looking to do business in any particular city, anywhere in the country, there is a master plan for that city or town. And the reason why is because every state says that every city and town, every 10 years, has to create a master plan. They have to tell everybody what their, what their plan is for development in that area. If you're looking to do business in a town, you should be reading that master plan so you know exactly what's going on. Had you done that, you would have been able to look at the master plan for the city of Nashua and know, hey, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't buy this raw land because I think they might be taking it back from us. We might not even be able to develop this. So that's why you look at it. And I'm going to get more into that in just a moment from a more of a micro level. That same year, an environmental impact study, EIS, was uh, a study began for um, required, had to be done for the BSP, the Broad Street Parkway, in order to get federal fund financing, federal funding. Uh, it was completed in 97. Uh, at that point, it was decided the New Hampshire Department of Transportation would now take over the case. The city was too big for the city. Let the state take it over and let the state deal with the feds. Okay. Now, let me just tell you, I lived at the other end of the city from where this was going on. And there was always talk very soon after, you know, my parents bought the house back in the 60s. So in about the 70s, there was a lot of talk that the state was going to put a highway through our neighborhood. 
and they got it probably from, from a master plan. And let me just tell you something. That discussion went on for years. It went on for years. We It hung over our heads as homeowners in that neighborhood, like the sort of Damocles. It hung that like you didn't know if you could sell because you'd have to tell the next buyer that, oh, the state might take this property through eminent domain. Well, ultimately, the state did. Back in the, in the mid-80s, the state came in and bought 18 homes in our neighborhood. My home didn't get taken. It didn't get torn down. But the state took our house as well through the same action because they figured, you know what? We're taking your neighborhood. This is not what you guys bought into. We'll take your house as well. And I'll never forget that the people who lived next door to us was a young married couple. This was their first home. They just moved in. And then they get a knock on the door from the state, come in and say, hey, um, we're, we're ready to offer you a price on your house. And like, what are you talking about? So, oh, didn't you know we're taking the whole neighborhood, neighborhood through eminent domain? And they're like, the realtor never told us. The seller never told us. We never knew that you guys were going to build a highway through this neighborhood. Had we known that, uh, we would never have moved here. So that is kind of like what's going on in this particular case, this inverse condemnation. Okay, while never formalized, it was anticipated the Broad Street Parkway would require taking a 200-foot right-of-way across the northern port portion of the property uh, parallel to the railroad tracks. From 98 to 2003, many parcels surrounding this property, when I say property, that we're talking about the subject property, uh, were acquired by the BSP. And in 1998, the, the petitioners, the owners, were told that the state might take the entirety of their property in the fall of 99. However, in early 99, they learned that the state was unsure as to how much land would be needed for the BSP and whether the petitioner's property would be taken in its entirety. Now think about it. These guys are trying to sell this property for development. They bought it back in, what did we say, 1983, 1985? Hold on, let me get the right year. Did it tell us when? Yeah, in 1980. They bought it in 1980. And here we are now in 1999, and they're talking about, okay, well, what are we going to do here? Now, that's that, that's in the long term. That's going to work against the developer because he bought it in 80. He had plenty of time to do something with it, and he didn't. Now it's 99. Now he wants to unload it. Now he can't, or so he thought. Now, um, under this plan, the connector loop extended onto a significant portion of the subject property which raised the possibility of a total taking of the property. At some point, a dispute arose between the city and the Department of Transportation as to the plans. In 2003, the plan was again revised to reduce the Broad Street Parkway from four lanes to two lanes. And let me tell you something. As I started reading this, this uh, uh, case, I'm listen, listening to well, where they're thinking about putting the access way, how big it was going to be. And I'll tell you right now, it's nothing like it ended up because I, I can use that road every single day. And it's not a four lane. It's a two lane. It's not over here by, by Brad, um, the, the street right, right around the corner. It's, it starts down there. In 1983, the petitioners began to have the property rezoned to allow for multifamily development because it wasn't zoned by right for multifamily. But ultimately, right now, that area, they're planning on doing a 300 unit uh, multifamily development right where this land is now, which was accomplished. This rezoning was accomplished in 1985. From 80 to 94, the petitioners spent between $82,000 and $120,000 preparing the property for sale. Um, okay, now let's get into some real details. And this is what the what the seller is hope what the buyer, the owner, is hoping to use as evidence as to how he got screwed by the state because state dragged their feet and dragged their feet and dragged their feet, preventing him from being able to sell it to anybody else. Um, the last purchase and sale agreement was entered into in 2002 for the sale price of $4 million. But at some point, the buyer learned that the city was unsure whether it would take the property for the BSP and asked the petitioners for an extension until they, he learned what the city intended to do. The petitioners decided to keep the property until it was resolved, whether the city was going to take the property 
And, and as a result, the sale did not go through four million dollars because the the developer wised up and he says, hey, I can't buy this thing. I can't start developing it only on the final of the states taking it. Um, since 2004, the petitions have not marketed the property. However, they have harvested timber off the land and made some money from that to pay probably pay their taxes. Uh, they allege that the petitioners allege that the delays and continuing uncertainty regarding this parkway deprived them of all economically viable use of their property as of 2004. In other words, once that that P uh, PSA got killed, they realized we can't, this, as long as the, the city sits around and starts dragging their feet, not doing anything, we can't do anything with this land. That is essentially a takings because they're out there saying this and preventing us from, from being able to, to do what we can with this land they took our property. That's what we are essentially calling inverse condemnation. They are taking the property, the value, the economic viability of the property without actually taking the property. They expect the tax bill to be paid every year, but because of them dragging their feet, we can't bet, we can't use this property the way we seem we see fit. Now, let's take this through the court process, all right? Following a 3-day bench trial, Oh, I can just imagine what that legal fee from Jerry Prunia would have been back in 19, in 2004. Following a three-day bench trial, the trial court found that the continuing uncertainty regarding the status of the Broad Street Parkway has not been so substantial and prolonged as to rise to a level of a taking. The appeal followed that. Uh, no, nope. so that was the lower court ruling. Oh, then, then it got into some, some tax issues. They, they filed an abatement, went up to the, the uh, Board of Land and Tax Appeals. I'm not going to get into that, though I will tell you right now, uh, City Hall is supposed to be calling me back. They want me to be on the Board of Assessors in Nashua. Uh, I, I was on it years ago. They asked me to be on it again. I didn't want to do it. Well, I went to one board meeting and they said they have 46 commercial properties that are log jammed in their system because they don't have the right people on the board to be able to evaluate and determine. I thought to myself, all right, I'll do it for a year. I'll bank through these 40 case, 46 cases and then uh, then get off. Um, so that's that's uh, that's what we've got. Um, all right. I'm not going to go through all the, all the typical stuff. But those of you following along, I'm on page five. Uh, the, the bottom paragraph where it starts out, the petitioners argue that the trial court erred under the New Hampshire Constitution and existing law case law by ruling that the city did not commit a, a taking by a inverse condemnation. Now, here's the definition. Listen to this. And this is very important. And I'm going to start getting into the case law that they use. Inverse condemnation occurs when a governmental body takes property, in fact, but does not formally exercise the power of eminent domain. Now, the, the key word there is in fact, meaning not, not uh, you know, de jure, de facto. Um, you know, we're talking about different types of segregation, segregation, uh, de jure segregation and de facto segregation, um, segregation by laws, se se segregation by act. Um, in this particular case, they don't actually take the property, but they act like they took the property uh inverse uh let me see okay when this occurs the governmental body has committed an unconstitutional taking and the property owner has a cause of action for compensation governmental action which substantially interferes with or deprives a person of the use of his property in whole or in part may constitute a taking even if the land itself is not taken that was okay. That was that was a quote from Sundell v. Town of New London, a New Hampshire case, a perfect case law, direct on point. Let's use this one. That's why Jerry Prunier put that case law in there because it's it's on point. But the problem was, it wasn't exactly on point. It was it was not the right case. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Okay, it goes on to say that um, uh, governmental action short of acquisition of title or occupancy has been held if its effect or or so complete are so complete 
uh, as to deprive the owner of all or most of his interest in the subject matter to amount to a taking. It goes on to say the interference must be more than inconvenience or annoyance and must be sufficiently direct, sufficiently peculiar, and, uh, and of sufficient magnitude to cause us to conclude that fairness and justice as between the state and the citizen requires that the burden imposed be borne by the public and not by the individual alone. Okay, that's the New Hampshire case. You think Jerry Prudian walked in and just mic dropped on the, on the Supreme Court table, but they went on to say, not so fast, Mr. Prunier, because the, 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 um, they went on to argue. Uh, let me see if I can find them. Okay. The problem is that there was a case in New Hampshire called a fun town case where it says that there's no actual, every case is done on a case by case basis. This inverse condemnation, there is no set rule. You have to look at each case independently and determine exactly how bad it is. They said the question is one of degree and its resolution is governed by no set test. That's another New Hampshire case. So right away, all right, now Jerry's back to the drawing board. Jerry now has to show that, well, this does meet the town of New London standard, uh, the Sundell standard, we'll call it. Uh, and now uh, what happens was, uh, let me see it. Okay, this is interesting. I like this. I like this quote. And this is what, what Jerry Prunier argued. He says, they argue that the city's actions have caused the subject property to be under a cloud of condemnation due to years of uncertainty as the, to the date of acquisition, the amount of land to be acquired by the city, and the access that would be available for any remainder. As a result, they maintain that the city's actions concerning the development of the, of the parkway over an extended period of time rendered their property impossible to develop or sell to a developer, effectively taking the property as of 2004. It all hinged around that purchase and sale agreement that fell through back in, in uh, 2004 for $4 million. We, now the court then goes on, the Supreme Court goes on to say, we have not had an occasion to address whether prolonged government planning and delayed condemnation proceedings constitute a taking. However, the weight of authority in other states and in the federal courts is that mere plotting and planning by a governmental body in anticipation of the taking of land for public use and preliminary steps taken to accomplish this does not constitute a taking. Oh, he was so close. But folks, that is a Colorado case. The New Hampshire Supreme Court had to go to Colorado to find a case on point. That's bad. I mean, it's bad that, I mean, I'm not blaming Jerry Prunier. He could never have seen that one coming. Uh, if he didn't raise that case, this, the New Hampshire Supreme Court were the, was the one that had to go that far out to sink Jerry's argument. Uh, the reasons most frequently cited for this rule is that the plotting or planning does not in and of itself amount to an invasion of property or deprive the owner of the use and enjoyment thereof, that the projected improvement may be abandoned and the property never actually disturbed, that the threat or possibility of condemnation is one of the conditions upon which all property is held, and that the rule is in the aid of the growth an expansion of municipality. In other words, they're saying, hey, welcome to our world. This is how things happen. Don't blame us because we're trying to make this city a better city. It's going to take us time. And during that time, you can benefit from the use of the property in so many different ways, but you cannot hold us to this standard that we have to hurry up uh, and get this thing done fast for your clock. Our clock is the one that, that, that is set for everyone in the whole city. Your needs are minuscule and therefore don't rise to the level of condemnation. Uh, undoubtedly, there'll be certain circumstances where landowners are caught in the so-called pre-condemnation blight or pre-condemnation cloud, 
when the con when the condemning authority engages in aggravating delay or untoward activity in instituting the condition. Folks, that's the, how my family lived for 10 to 15 years, I'd say. Everybody knew the neighborhood was going. We just didn't know when. And that, that's really a crappy way to live. And, uh, you know, when they finally stepped in and took the neighborhood through them in a domain, they did a nice job. They really uh, made everyone whole. Um, they even took the home. See, that, our next door neighbor, who were the newlyweds, their house wasn't set to be taken. Ours was not set to be taken. They were even further down the street. But the, but the state said, oh, boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's too bad. We'll, we'll buy your house from you. And I thought that was a pretty, pretty good thing. Kind of love New Hampshire. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it goes on to the risk we take. We agree. The fact that at some future time, land might be taken under eminent domain, even where the threatened taking is imminent, is but one of the conditions on which, on which an owner holds property. And that was a Massachusetts case. That, that was a city of Chicopee case. So as you can see, the New Hampshire Supreme Court really had to it really had to step out of the way uh, and 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 find all these cases outside of the of New Hampshire and really outside of the region in order to, to prove their case. Um, let me see. I'm just going to bring it. Let me go uh, about Let me see. Here, this one I had, uh, this was Peacock versus the County of Sacramento, California. Um, the county adopted an ordinance and rezoned certain property in the area of the airport, effectively frustrating the plaintiff's economic development of their property. The court found that as a result of this county's actions, the plaintiffs were deprived totally of the economic use of their property within the take area, which resulted in inverse condemnation. Thus, the, def the plaintiff, Peacock, involved the application of an ordinance and zoning regulations to frustrate and freeze development of any meaningful kind within that area determined by the court to have been taken. Here, however, as the trial court found in New Hampshire, the city had not taken affirmative steps to prevent the petitioners from developing the property. In other words, when he went back to have it rezoned as a multifamily property, um, he ended up... Uh, hurting his case. I don't necessarily mean that he hurt his case, but he showed the world that the city wasn't wasn't uh, causing, it, causing any problems. Let me see. All right. So that is it. Let me read you the, the final decision, what they said. Indeed, the uh, Broad Street Parkway could have been abandoned, leaving the petitioner's property undisturbed. <laughs> the mere enactment of, and this is how they concluded it, the mere enactment of legislation which authorizes condemnation of property cannot be a taking. Just the, the filing of the legislation, such legislation may be repealed or modified or appropriations for it may fail. Based upon these considerations, we hold that the, that the trial court properly declined the rule that fairness and justice as between the city and the petitioners, require that any burden imposed be borne by the city. So was that the right decision? I think so. I think so. I wouldn't want to be the developer. I wouldn't want to be Jerry Prunier. I think uh, Steve uh, uh, Steve um, Bennett, uh, that's why he's now the, the city attorney, uh, because he tried this case, the, the, um, the JK Realty, JKL Realty case. Um, I'll tell you. As a builder, as a developer, owner, operator of land, it's a risk you take. And I think on, on the good side is the fact that you get the, um, uh, you know, the state, the, the provision within the Constitution that, that uh, protects the um, protects us from losing value by government actions. Now, is this is rent control an inverse condemnation? I always thought it was. But there have been numerous case law on point where they've the courts have come back and said, no, it is not a takings. Oh, I, I find that so hard to believe. Um, but that is um, that is uh, how uh, our system works. And I think New Hampshire, uh, the city of Nashua uh, got out of that one. Um, you know, we were victims of that uh, in, of that um, type of eminent domain condemnation. Uh, but. 
we benefited from it. This developer, you know, he bought it back in the 80s. He probably like land banked it, as we call it, just held on to it. And then, uh, you know, when it was finally all said and done, I, I would like to go back over there. There's a lot of development going on in that area right now. I mean, that part of town, I'll tell you, folks, that Broad Street Parkway is not as great as everybody thought it was going to be. It's not some big, uh, you know, you, you go down to Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, Kentucky has two roads, two bands of roads that go like, uh, you know, diameter, two two uh, expanding diam- diameter roads around the Le- city of Lexington, Kentucky. That's a great way to get around the town. This Broad Street Parkway to reduce, uh, you know, um, a traffic on Main Street. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but not all that much. Um, I'm not so sure that that was a uh, the best the best way to do things uh, back then. They probably should have taken a lot more road um, and uh, put a, a broader parkway around it. But that was an interesting case. Um, and if anybody else else has any other uh, um, real estate law classes or real estate law um, uh, cases that we want to uh, evaluate, please uh, shoot me an email, charles at dobbinslaw.com, um, and uh, let me know. But I hope this was helpful. I hope this was fun. Uh, I tell you, I love real estate. It's uh, it's a blast, especially these types of cases. When you when you put the historical um, matrix on top of it, it just it, it comes to life. Um, and I tell you, one of the most fun things, if you've ever done it, go to your registry of deeds for your town. Uh, and go through the grantors index and, uh, and uh, just start looking at some of the names and some of the streets. And it's just like a, it's like a history book. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So, all right, that is it for this law school classroom. Um, you will be getting an email at the top of next week uh, as to what the topic is going to be for next week's uh, class. And if anybody has any recommendations or suggestions or they want uh, me to cover anything in particular, please do not hesitate to uh, reach out to me and uh, and let me know. All right. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, and it really helps us out when you do that. So make sure you do that.